So what we're going to do is we're going to go on to transforming the facilitators. And by facilitators, that's anyone that makes the purchase uh, uh, and exploitation uh, of a person possible. And so when I think about facilitators, I think of a very specific, difficult story. So uh, we partner with investigators. We have our own investigation team. Um, and we sometimes we get what's called like button cam. A button cam is a camera that is a button and will be sent footage because we're working in a certain red light district. We'll be sent footage um, of either a trafficker or a pedophile saying, hey, do you know who this guy is? Do you know where this person is? Or do you know who these kids are? And so uh, we got sent some button cam footage of a trafficker that was going to be getting out of prison. And, and uh, so they said, hey, be on the lookout for this guy. And then they let us know, hey, this guy had trafficked some of the kids you serve. And so, you know, I'm, I'm ticked off. I'm like, I'm going to find this guy and I'm going to get him put in jail. And so at this point, we had started... Uh, Lord's Gym, which is a men's outreach. It's a weightlifting, kickboxing gym for gang members, drug dealers, traffickers, and pimps. And uh, we had started this outreach. And um, I remember he walks into the gym. And I, I had this moment of like, am I supposed to punch this guy or am I supposed to love this guy? And it was a real conflict in my heart. So I punched him. No, I'm just joking. Um, no, so I, but there was this conflict in my heart where I was saying, what, what am I really called to do? Like, how, how, how am I supposed to walk out my faith in this? And I felt uh, the Lord, uh, I believe, put a whisper in my heart that caused me and gave me a direction. But it was this thought. Perhaps this man is like Paul. I was thinking of Paul in the New Testament, this person who was the greatest enemy of the church, yet God's desire for him was to redeem him, to show the depths of his love for the broken uh, so that the world can be reached. And it was just that simple thought. Perhaps this man is Paul. And we invited him in and we started to um, work out and share the love of God. Part of the gym is it's free free admittance, all we have to do is we share something about what it is to be a godly man. We take some time to pray and we offer um, to invite them to church. And we've seen that simple solution, that simple thing, lives have been changed. We even had uh, one person who was just notoriously horrible show up to our gym expecting to be turned away. And the manager um, said the most powerful thing. He says, if I was the boss of this gym, I would turn you away because you're despicable. But the sign says the Lord's gym, so you can come back in. Uh, and God got a hold of his life. Uh, so we're talking about facilitators here and specifically how do we transform facilitators? Not how do we stop facilitators because as Christians sometimes we talk about let's arrest this guy and let's transform this guy. And and let me be clear about how we at AIM pursue this. We pursue two simultaneous tracks when it comes to traffickers uh, that we know of. We are trying to gather evidence to see them put in prison, and we're trying to lead them to Christ at the same time. Whichever one comes first, we're praising God. But we, I, I believe that that's how we, we should see this issue when it comes to transforming uh, facilitators. And so when we think about facilitators, most often we think of pimps, but I want us to think about two different categories of facilitators because the way we approach this should be different. Virtual facilitators and human facilitators. Virtual facilitators and human facilitators. So human facilitators, pimps, traffickers, these are people that we're talking about. They prey on runaways. They, they will be at places where they're homeless shelters. They're looking for people on the streets to prey on them. Uh, and we've talked about that. They're going to befriend them. They're going to say, hey, I can be like family to you. Uh, uh, some people call them uh, Romeo pimps, meaning trying to weave their way into someone's heart, this mix of fear and love. Uh, and and the, we, we've talked about that. But virtual facilitators... Um, are like websites, Backpage.com, 
Red Book. I, I mean, I could, I could list uh, a lot of websites. I'm not because they're really horrible, especially for guys. I mean, a lot of them, it's almost like they're just straight pornography of people locally. Um, but there's tons of websites um, where the facilitation of trafficking happens through websites. There are newspaper publications, free newspapers. If you ever give like the weekend or like the, the, those free week, open up the back. You will be shocked at what's in the back. There's two types of ads in the back, uh, prostitution ads and uh, uh, where to get marijuana. Those are the only two types of ads in those entire publications, and they're free and they're all over the place. Um, don't throw those away. If you pull them out and throw them away, that's considered reader, and they actually get more readership from that. Talk to the owner. If, if it's at a store that you go to, you can talk to the owner to say, discontinue uh, uh, this, or I, I won't come to this location anymore. Uh, but there are virtual facilitators out there. So a lot of the time, what we do when we see these websites, specifically, let's talk Craigslist. Craigslist, it was a big thing. The facilitation of trafficking and sexual exploitation was happening through Craigslist. Everyone got up in arms and we said, hey, let's stop this, let's stop this, let's stop this. They kind of stopped it and everyone celebrated. But I'm here to say something that might be counterintuitive. I think that not only is not a good use of our time, I think about what we're thinking about virtual facilitators with the completely wrong paradigm. What other crime can you think of where people advertise when, where, and their phone numbers of how to get a hold of them? Think about that. Murderers don't have a website where they say, hey, I'm a murderer. Here's my cell phone number. Here's how to get a hold of me. And you can actually, oh, geez, I'm going to call that person and find them. Virtual facilitation in websites like Backpage.com offers us one of the greatest opportunities for ministry, one of the greatest opportunities for rescue available. The problem is, one, the resources to take advantage of that. One, do the police have the time and the manpower and the mandate from the community to use that? When I talk to police officers about uh, Craigslist getting shut down, 100% said, don't quote me on this, but we're, we're really pissed off about that. I used to be able to go into my office, scroll through Craigslist, call someone up, and when they showed up, arrest them. It's like, how awesome was that? And then they shut Craigslist down, and now it's even harder. So the issue was, wasn't, yes, this is bad, but were the police officers taking advantage of it? How about ministries taking advantage of it? See, if we really want to transform virtual facilitators... We should do it by saying, every time I put my stinking phone number on one of these sites, a Christian calls up and tries to do ministry to me. <laughs> Am I right? I mean, that should be the reason, hey, you can't, you can't put your phone number on these websites anymore because a ministry team will show up to the hotel. And if it's not them, it's going to be the cops. That's how you transform virtual facilities. They present us with the greatest opportunity. You just heard about a ministry that took the faces from these ads to rescue girls. It's an opportunity. And we can't think when it comes to virtual facilitators that uh, what, what we need to do is get them shut down. Because a new one will pop up with a different server in a different location, harder to get shut down. So this is the, the, what this is, is our opportunity to create ministry. When we have the Super Bowl coming to this area... I think one of the most practical things you could do is if you get a team, you get uh, women that can go on these websites, don't have the men going on these websites, but have a, a team of women that can go on these websites, shoot, you could be calling numbers all day long. Hey, we're local church. We're throwing a Super Bowl party. You want to come to Super Bowl party? Call up every stinking ad on that web page and invite them to a, a Super Bowl party at church. They're giving you their phone number to call them. See, we need a paradigm shift when it comes to virtual facilitators that this isn't the biggest problem, that this is our biggest opportunity as ministry. Uh, this is our biggest opportunity for law enforcement. We need to go to law enforcement and say, what resources do you need, whether manpower or money, and what mandate do you need from the community to make this happen? 
A lot of the time, law enforcement wants to focus on this, but they don't have manpower. Or if they have manpower, they don't have time. If they don't have time, it's resources. And if they have all those, they say, but we need the city manager or the mayor to say, this is what I want you to focus on. So they just need three churches to call the mayor and say, stop trafficking, and then the police can go. So virtual facilitation is the biggest opportunity for us. We just have to make sure the law enforcement and we as ministries are taking advantage of it. How about human facilitators? Who are they? In general, there's not too many statistics about this, but um, in general, uh, human facilitators uh, and gang culture go together. Fatherlessness goes together with pimps um, and youth who grow up in high crime rate areas where becoming a pimp and sexual exploitation is a norm. It's a cultural norm. So you're looking for those three things, areas where uh, uh, high-level gangs, fatherlessness, high crime rate areas. Great ways to transform uh, human facilitators, juvie hall ministry, gang outreach, big brothers program, inner city outreach. My wife referred to a ministry called Adopt the Block. It was awesome. A church literally went uh, to the local police department and said, if you could pinpoint two neighborhoods where 90% of your crime comes from, could you just show us here and here? They pointed to it. So the church said, we're going to adopt those, those neighborhoods. We're going to adopt that block. People consistently, it's really funny. I used to do this training and used to recruit for adopt a block. Uh, and they'd say, what type, of, uh, what type of training do you get? You know, because, you know, I'm doing this training like suburbia. And they're like, geez, they're doing gang ministry. And they're, they're terrified. They're like, what type of the training? It's like, show up at 530, get on the bus at 535. You knock on a door and say, I'm a Christian. How can I love and serve you? That's literally it. And you consistently go back every week. And so uh, adopt block is a fantastic program. Um, juvenile Hall. You have people, I, I'm not, this is kind of a joke, I'm not saying this in a crude way, it's a captive audience. They're there. They're bored. And they're looking for godly men to pour into their lives. It's a great opportunity. You find, find a chaplain at Juvie Hall and say, who's in here for uh, 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 trafficking pimps, being a pimp, being a gang member? Start a Bible study. Transform a facilitator. You know, a lot of the times when I talk about this, when I, I get the least amount of interest, because in general, people are just straight up terrified of like, well, I didn't grow up in a gang. I don't know what to say. Uh, I, I'm scared. I, don't, I wouldn't know what to do. Um, but one of the things I want to talk about is the church's greatest roadblock to impact that I've seen as I kind of go back and forth between Cambodia and the U.S. It's not our lack of training. A lot of times, can I get another training? Can I get another training? Can someone teach me how to do inner city ministry? And yes, sometimes we do training. Sometimes ah, I don't have enough finances. If we really had enough money, we could impact the world. We could impact this community. Oh, we're crying out for God's revival. It's not a lack of anointing. It's not a lot of lack of training or finances. Our greatest proximity, and listen to me, uh, our greatest roadblock is proximity. That we just, when was the last time we even talked to a broken person? Let alone saw a broken person. Let alone hugged a broken person. For some of us, it's years. When was the last time we talked to a drug addict? For some of us, we've never talked to a drug addict. There is a, an issue of proximity in the church that we are so far from the hurting. We're so far from the broken. And I already gave this analogy, but Jesus Christ, when it comes to healing, he tied healing to physical touch because he knows our propensity to distance ourselves from the hurting for the uncomfortable situation from dangerous people. But God is saying, when you pray for the hurting, lay your hands on them. Because he wants us close to the hurting. So close you can touch them. He didn't say when you think about the hurting and the broken and the sick, go home and pray for them. 
from your home. It's great that we pray for them. But a lot of us, if you can only take one thing from this, is get in proximity to the hurting. They talked about opportunities right now. You can sign up right now and in a week be walking on a red light district, praying with, loving on people that are hurting and need Jesus. When it comes to human facilitators, I think a lot of people tune out because they're thinking, you know, I don't know what to say, I'm not cool. And that's not the roadblock, it's proximity. If you're honest, transparent, and kind, I, listen, I have no gang background. I grew up in a Christian home, but I do gang ministry in Cambodia all the time, and I don't know gang lingo, anything. I'm just kind. I'm just honest. I try to show the love of God, and that's plenty enough. But proximity is the thing that is blocking us. Favorite quote, a guy named C.T. Studd. Favorite name, too. That's a good name. Some want to live within the sounds of a church bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard from hell. C.T. Studd was a missionary out of England. Uh, he had a lot of money. He was a successful athlete, and he sold it all to become a missionary. And I think part of C.T. Studd's heart needs to be back and ingrained in the church. We get, we get fixated with results that we forget about time and proximity. When I was working in Cambodia, we're trying to rescue this young girl. Horrible situation. You could see the physical abuse and the sexual abuse is just physically on her body every day. It drained my spirit seeing her every day being abused, every day seeing the challenges. And we continue to serve. And I probably worked two months with law enforcement trying to get a legal rescue of this girl. And um, I had a break coming up in the States, and I'm thinking, I got to get this girl rescued before, um, before I get back, go back to the States for the break. I don't want to go with that hanging over my head. And sure enough, the day comes when I'm leaving to get on an airplane and I see this girl coming into church and it, it's like I'm ashamed of myself that I haven't been able to affect change in her heart or in her life. And so I do the only thing I know to do. I pick her up, I just toss her in the air. I'm just going to keep tossing her into the air. And she's kind of like limp, comatose. I keep tossing her into the air until she's smiling. I keep tossing her in the air until I'm sweating. And I'm just thinking, if all I can do is toss her into the air and give her like 10 minutes of smiling, that's it. That, that's what I'll do. I have the time and I have the energy right now to do it. And I continued to do that till my arms didn't work and I was sweaty. And then she, she ran off. And I felt like the Lord whispered to my heart this simple idea of, that's where I wanted you to start in the first place. That's where we need to start. And for some of us, as we're talking about this issue, we're talking about results. Now, I want to see this, I want to see this, I want to see this. But God is saying, I just want to see you with the hurting. I want to see you hugging a person that is so different than you that you're saying, God, would your love flow through me? I am scared and I am in need of your love. If for some of you, this might be the takeaway of the whole trip. To get you out of the confines of this wall. We're not called to endorse justice in here. We're called to do justice out there. And so for us, I believe with my whole heart and I've seen it with my eyes, the transformative power of God as he ministers to fatherless boys, as they find their identity in Christ, as they find peer mentors. But the issue isn't the fact that, well, I need training. Nope, you got enough training. The issue is proximity. So let's pray and ask God to break down the walls in our lives. God, would you transform us? Would you cause us to reach out beyond the four walls of our own lives? Yeah, and get us close to the hurting. Break our heart again. We don't need an awareness video, God. I pray that you would, Lord, 
by your sovereignty, even if we don't want to break out of our walls, you would cause people to walk into our world and, Lord, break down the walls that we create. Forgive us for trying to create heaven on earth, Lord. Heaven comes later, God. Help us to build your kingdom right now on this earth. Help your church to move towards the hurting. Help it to be a rescue center, a yard from hell. In Jesus' name, amen.